Okay, hello everybody, Shalom Aleichem. If there's any trouble with your ability to see me, you're going to have to inform me because uh, to me I look okay. <laughs> uh, Shayna Vilomovsky, Mrs. Vilomovsky has been on my case for a very long time to do this. And um, if you bother enough, you get, right? So we, we're here. We're going to do this class. And I had a lot of time to think about uh, how we're going to do this. This is a class on Betochen. Um, Betochen is a serious business. It's a very, very serious business. It's also very important and a very relevant business. And I've been thinking for a long time, what's the best way, what's the most credible way, what's the most honest way that I could talk about uh, Betochen. And I'll tell you why. Because talking about Betochen is not like talking about uh, Gebrox, you know, or Chol of Yisrael. These are actionable things, right? You either keep Gebrox, you don't keep Gebrox, right? Uh, Mitz Hashem, we're all careful about Chol of Yisrael, and Mitz Hashem, we're all careful about Gebrox. But these are parts of Yiddishkeit that have to do with behavior. Betochen is Mosul Alev. You see, Betochen has everything to do with the heart. And anything which has to do with the heart um, involves um, uh, subjectivity, right? Depends how much of a man you are, if he has man mokim, and the time and the place. And credibility, honesty about betachen is a test, it's a challenge. But to say that in different words, if a person has a good day with God today, that doesn't mean that they're going to have a good one tomorrow. Emuna and Betochen both are things that we constantly need to keep fresh. A person learns, I'm a man, I put on tefillin. I'm sure there's many men on here. I learned my little boy, my father took me to shul and told me to put on tefillin. After a while, it wasn't a particularly long time, my father stopped taking me to shul because I figured it out on my own. Um, we learn how to do many things. Once we learn how to do them, we know how to do them, and we just do them. And Muna and Betochen, every day has to be new. Every day has to be fresh. Every day has to be inspired. Every day has to be positive, and every day has to be soulful, metanemis. And this is very sensitive. So when you get a speaker to come and talk about Muna and Betochen, I would imagine that the, the preeminent emotion that that speaker has, what occupies the mind of that speaker is not so much what the material is, but how to mean it, how to say it, metanemis, how to say it, to give it, to communicate it in a way, not only in a way, that in fact is emis, right? Uh, we tell stories about people who are very great lecturers and they didn't believe what they said, so the people were inspired and that was where it ended. If a person is going to move another person, there's the famous Sefer Ayosha, which the Rebbe always quotes, If it comes from the heart, it goes to the heart, and it has the desired effect. And whether I like it or not, I tonight I'm the lecturer, I am the teacher. And um, I'm supposed to speak works that come from the heart, which means that I have to mean what I'm saying. And it's not so easy. It's really not so easy. So I decided to teach. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to teach. I'm going to talk about Amuna, and then I'm going to talk about Betochen. This is my plan. Um, I don't know how tight my hour window is, but I would like to, I prepared many, many notes. I have a class that I prepared, and I would like to teach Amuna and then teach Betochen. In other words, the data, the facts come from Sfarim. I'm certainly not making that up. So that's Emes Lamite, and the day we should help them. I myself will have a little bit of a connection to my own neshama and to my own source of joy and faith. So what I will say will be they'll come from my heart and then they'll enter into your heart and have a favorable and a effect, a favorable and a lasting effect. So here we go. This is what we're going to be doing. So I want to start with this. I want us to talking about the Rebbe. Number one, I saw in a Sefer, which is apparently quite reliable, 
that the Rebbe Tzinchaya Mushka, the Rebbe's wife, the Rebbe Tzinchaya Mushka was asked what, in her opinion, was the most outstanding characteristic of her husband, the Rebbe. She lived with the Rebbe for almost 60 years. She knew him well. She certainly knew him better than anybody else did. And she certainly was a um, mevinte. She was certainly qualified to assess a man of the Rebbe's greatness. And she was asked what, in her opinion, was the greatest characteristic of her husband. And she said, his emuna. Not as Avas Yisrael, and not as Yeres Shamayim, and not his Goines, and not his Dvekes Nelakus. She said the thing that she was most moved by vis-a-vis -vis her husband, the Rebbe, was his Amunah, which is incredible. And uh, I will qualify that with a quote from Geula Cohen. Geula Cohen was a Israeli politician, a Svadish woman. She certainly believed in God. She may have even been from her Paya Pratim, but she was a as they say in politics, a right-winger. And she had a very strong relationship with the Rebbe. She met the Rebbe many times. She consulted the Rebbe on many issues. But the Rebbe had a meaningful relationship with her. And she wrote in the old uh, Rebbe album that came out in the 1970s, a little blurb about the Rebbe. And when she wrote, as you talk to the Rebbe about medicine, he sounds like a doctor. You talk to him about physics, he sounds like a physicist. You talk to him about politics sounds like a politician you talk to him about military matters talks about a general you talk to him about God he sounds like a child and if I'm not mistaken she writes in her piece that I've met I know many great men and women and I've been very very impressed by them but a believer doesn't only leave an impression a believer moves you and the Rebbe is a believer, that's what she writes. A believer, a maimon, someone who really has a relationship with the Ebishter, doesn't just say, doesn't just leave an impression on you, what a great person. He leaves an impression on you that because of that person, I need to be something different. I need to be something else. And um, this is her sense of the Rebbe. And it's, I guess it's a translation. It's a Pirish Rashi and the words of the Rebbe, it's the greatest, the most outstanding characteristic of the Rebbe was his Amunah. And finally, I saw in one of the books that a, a secular person who had a Yechidus by the Rebbe and um, he knew how intelligent the Rebbe was, he spent time with the Rebbe and he asked the Rebbe directly, how could a person who is as intelligent as the Rebbe be a believer? To him, it seemed like a conflict. Uh, faith is for simple people. Faith, they call, what they call the opium of the masses. How could a man with the Rebbe's intellect be a maimon? So the Rebbe said to this person, I wish I remember where I saw it because it's such a wonderful quote, the Rebbe said to this person, it's a different skill set. A moon is a different skill set, a different chush. That's the quote. Ad kan losh narav. What it means, in other words, is this. If would you say that a musician or an artist is an intellectual, would you say that a musician or an artist is an intellectual? That's a question. And of course the answer is, it makes no difference. One has nothing to do with it. He may be intellectual, he may not be intelligent, but his art is separate from his intellect. They're two different parts of the brain, as they like to call it, two different parts of the soul, and they don't overlap. They're parallel, but they're not uh, one after the other. They're not successive. They're different. So a person can be a great musician and be a simple person, a person can be a great musician and be a great intellectual. The same is true of any art. But they're not connected. And the same is true. Faith is not the end of reason, as secular people mistakenly construe or imagine. If, the, if, if my faith comes from my reason, then the more of an intellectual I am, the more difficulty in faith I'll have. And as this secular person just supposed, assumed, that if you're too smart, you can't really be a maimon. So the Rebbe said, one has nothing to do with the other. Your spiritual, your faith-based relationship with Hashem is not about your brain, it's about your soul. About your humanity, really. About what truly, what truly separates man from animal. And if you're in touch with that part of yourself, you're a believer, and that faith is notwithstanding your intellect, your superior intellect, or your deficient intellect, or your average intellect, is in no way affected, is in no way affected uh, by your faith, and your faith is no way affected by your intellect because they're completely separate things. So here we go. I want to talk about emuna first. Emuna means faith, and betachen second. And betachen means 
trust. What is emuna? What is emuna? My students ask me all the time, what's the difference between emuna and betochen? I say, the difference between emuna and betochen is the difference between breathing air and drinking water. You breathe air constantly. Emuna is a constant condition. Betochen is a choice. And betochen you exercise when you have certain conditions. It's like drinking water, eating food. You do it when it's warranted, when it's called for. But amuna is as constant as breathing air. The baseline condition of a human being, and certainly the baseline condition of a Jew, is that he's a believer, and he should be a believer. And, as I already mentioned, this faith doesn't come from your knowledge and from your studies and from your analysis. This faith comes from your mother's milk. This faith comes from your grandmother who sits a whole day and says, Tillim. This faith comes from the real people in our lives that we encounter, many of whom may not be as intelligent as us and as cool as we are and as youthful as we are, but they're far more genuine and they just have a simple and a natural and an inherent and an inner sense of Hashem. And they communicate it to us, not with philosophical arguments, not with a debate, not with a discussion, but by their presence and by their own emuna. Emuna is meant to be transmitted from parent to child, from teacher to student, in a nonverbal communication. It's not something that you have to teach, it's something that you have to demonstrate. Hashem is real, and it's just that simple. And my parents knew that because they received it from their parents, and my, I, my parents gave it to me, and I hope I gave that to my children. And uh, often the strongest basis for our emuna come from people in our lives who, in terms of what we consider a worldly success, may not be so successful, but in terms of their genuine relationship with the Abishta, they're incredibly successful. And that's how moon is supposed to be transmitted. I must tell you that I remember years and years ago, when I was a young man, I met a, a Balchuva who was very, very intelligent, and he said to me, the difference between your faith and my faith is that your faith comes from your father, my faith is from Ramba. I said, what does that mean? He said, I wasn't raised by people who believed. So I had to acquire my faith through my mind. You acquired your faith because of your parents. And I remember thinking then how tragic that is, how unfortunate that is. And it, it, it may be true. It may be true that faith is something which has not been, some people may grow up without faith and therefore to acquire faith is something that they have to struggle with. And it's very, very unfortunate. It's very, very sad. Because the, the strength of faith is in the fact that it's poshut, that it's simple, that it's natural. And if a person, because of the way they were raised, has to invent for themselves faith, make themselves into a maimin, um, that's a very, very painful process. It's a very, very painful process, and it's a very, very difficult thing to achieve. But uh, for many of us, even if we didn't grow up in religious homes, but we grew up in, in God-centric homes, you know, a lot of people are not so frum, but they believe in the Ebishter. They communicate that faith, they communicate that belief in God, that belief in goodness to their children, not necessarily with the spoken word, just like by, by what they are. And I'm going to share some anecdotes that, uh, that are related to faith. The first is a familiar one from my own family. I, I have to tell you, when I sit down to give talks on Betochen and Amuna, I think immediately of, of my own upbringing and my own parents, my own grandparents, my parents on the Gezunzai and my grandparents on Leia And I sort of feel like it's not fair that I'm sharing with the whole world my personal stories. Why, is it, why does anybody have to hear my stories? So I thought I'll, te I'll say a different one than the one I always tell. I, I always have stories I tell, but my grandfather, this is a different story. My mother's father, Mother Zogazunzain's father, his name was Abishol Yechazkel Stern. He was born in Brooklyn in 1918, which means that he was alive today, he'd be 104 years old. And um, he was raised by Galician parents, or as he liked to say, parents from Czechoslovakia, who, who were from a Hasidic stock, and they were connected to one of the many branches of Tzans, uh, Strapkev. Stropke of a Hasid is that a Stropke of a Stiebel in Williamsburg and the whole thing. My great grandfather, whose name was Menachem Mendel Stern, um, would get jobs in Jewish companies and Jewish businesses. And on Friday, he would inform his employer that he's not coming on Shabbos 
And his employer would say, the kim snit morgen, a kim snit Shabbos, kim nish muntik. If you're not going to come Sunday, Saturday, don't come on Monday. And he came home to his wife, whose name was Chaya. She passed away way before I was born, before my mother got married. And he would tell his wife, who was a mother of five children, that was fired. And her reaction, and this happened to parents, my grandfather would tell us all the time, it must have happened many times. His wife, instead of reacting with fear and concern, oh no, what are we going to eat? She would say, don't worry. God Almighty provided until now. I provided, God Almighty provided going forward. And this is how these children grew up. You know, especially after the the crash of the uh, stock market and there was the terrible depression. They were very, very poor. They were terribly impoverished. And uh, But their mother's faith empowered their father to keep Shabbos and inspired those children who were growing up in a pre-war America to be raised with, with incredibly Jewish values and they would then raise children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren growing up after the war who you know, had completely Yiddish existences. They went to yeshiva and their koilo people and their shluchim and all the rest and so on and so forth. But this is one of the stories my grandfather would tell. That his father would come home from work on Friday and say, I have no job, and she would say, not to worry. Um, my grandfather once told me, you don't know how it feels to come home from school and find your furniture on the sidewalk. In other words, it was a real thing. It wasn't the, the lack of work and the lack of income had very, very severe consequences that were imminent, they were real, that they could relate to. And nevertheless, they had Yisamuna, the day which is going to provide. Another anecdote that I want to share in line of Emuna, this is before Betochen, is a story that Professor Vevel Green tells in one of his books. Vevel Green, all of us, Shalom, had a very special relationship with the Rebbe from the early Chabad Bali Tshuva, from the early 1960s, and he was kind enough to leave behind, he's now deceased, a number of books which he discusses his relationship with the Rebbe and the Rebbe's influence on his life. Um, I really would encourage you to find those books and read them. They're delightful. They're, he's a great writer, he's a great sense of humor, and they're very, very easy to read and also very important. And in one of those books, he tells a story that in one of his earliest meetings with the Rebbe, and he was a real scientist, he was a biologist, he was a smart guy. The Rebbe said to him, I want to ask you to do me a favor, as the Rebbe told him. And the favor was that the Rebbe asked him to get a notebook and to record in this notebook any event that he experiences in his life of Ashkoch Pratis. When he experiences in his own life the hand of God, when he sees in his own life that something happened, that based on the natural order of things should not occur, and it occurred most fortuitously, because there is a Yad Avaya, the Evish is governing the world, you should write it down in this notebook. He should keep a ledger, keep a record of Ashgach Pratis events in his life. Now, I don't know if he did it, but the story he tells. The Rebbe asked him to do it, and um, if I understand correctly, he understood what the Rebbe was doing. A person is a great intellectual, a very great intellectual, a brilliant intellectual, and is engaged in the physical sciences. They chop up the world into tiny little pieces and try to understand each peach by itself and how these pieces stick together. And a person like that can be burdened by his or her knowledge in the kind of way that faith becomes difficult. And the Rebbe didn't say, use your science as a medium to your faith. The Rebbe said, when you see God, write it down. When something happens in your life which can't be explained within your scientific paradigm, Write it down. In other words, said, let's make it easy. Let's not come to God through science. It's, it's almost impossible to do. Come to God through, through your experience, through your life. Now, you'll still have the question, how do I reconcile my faith with the fact that science, where it is right now, seems to leave us with many questions that challenge that faith, but you'll keep them separate. And the faith will be pure. The faith will be healthy. The faith will be living. The faith will be sustaining. And this is what the Rebbe asked him to do. And it's an incredible lesson in life. That when it comes to Amuna, we don't come to Amuna through our brain. We come to Amuna through our grandmother. We come to Amuna through our observations of Ashgach HaPratis in our lives. And we celebrate them. And we draw strength from them. And we make Hashem realer and realer in our life through that.
another anecdote that I've also shared in the past. I used to give a shir in Chabad House in Flatbush here in Brooklyn for many years. I don't know how many years it went on for a lot of years. Maybe six or seven. I taught Tanya twice, the whole book. And I taught Siddur for a while. We did a lot of nice, interesting things. And my audience was constantly changing. The clientele would change. The first day there was one group of people, then those people left, and another group came in, so on. So when I was teaching Tanya the third time around, I thought it three times actually. Teaching the third time around, which I did over a longer period of time, there was a man whose name was Moshe, his English name was Morris, if I'm not mistaken, who began to show up regularly, religiously, and he would sit in the class and he would sometimes ask questions. I engaged him and I realized very quickly that this is a very, very intelligent man. He was a scientist, very bright guy. And he was an engineer, he worked for the city, he was building bridges. And he came to the Tanya class every week. And I remember we were learning against HaKadosh. We were learning difficult stuff in Kabbalah. And I found it curious that a man like him would find the Tanya class compelling. Particularly since I discovered that he had very little background. He was born and raised in Brooklyn, but he, he didn't even have a Talmud background. He didn't even know what a Pesach Seder was. So I started asking him questions about what brings him to the Shir. So he told me, I'll never forget this as long as I live. He told me, I want... I want a relationship with God. Quote, I want a relationship with God. So I said to him, if you want a relationship with God, then you must have figured out all the conflicts between science and religion. Because you're an intellectual, and you're a scientist, and you know how many problems there are vis-a-vis, -vis, quote, the God question, end quote, and science. So I said to him, if you want a relationship with God, you must have found a good place within your paradigm for God. Then he says, I don't care. This is his words, I don't care. I want a relationship with God. I said, no, I haven't figured anything out. I haven't resolved any questions. I want a relationship with God. And it was one of the most impacting experiences of my life because this man confirmed for me everything that I was always taught. It was in the Hasidus teaches, everything that Rebbe teaches. That faith doesn't come after reason. It's separate. You can be the smartest guy in the world. And your relationship with Abishtha could be like a child. That's not simplistic. It's simple. It's profound. It's deep. He was a brilliant man intellectually he was involved in whatever specialty field he was involved with and I'm sure there were many questions from his field as it related to God but he knew that there was a God and he wanted a relationship with him period the end full stop how did he know he didn't know it from his physics he knew it from his neshama and that's emuna. that's emuna. that's not betoch that's emuna. that's faith and here was a man who was very secular, very unschooled in Yiddishkeit, who said, I want faith, I want a connection to God, I want a relationship to God to have meaning. Um, if I may uh, insert right here something for us to consider about faith. The, the quotable quote, the expression which is often used is to make a leap of faith. The meaning of the expression to make a leap of faith is actually found in Chassidus. Chassidus talks about Amun and uses the word Dilag, a leap. The meaning of this term, a leap of faith, as it's understood in Torah, is as follows. If a person is bright, a person is smart, and they use their intellect to understand what God is, they use their intellect to understand the relationship that God has with the world and therefore how relevant God is in their lives, all the smarts in the world, pardon me, in no way give you a relationship with Hashem. They do not connect you to God. They give you information. A person is not a believer because he knows that there's a God. A person is not a believer because he has proof there's a God. A person is not a believer because they can convince you there's a God. The person is a believer because he has a relationship with Him. And that's what the leap means. You have to put your brain aside. You have to let it go. If you came to faith through reason, you have to put the reason aside because the most important thing is not the proof that there is a God. The most important thing is the intimacy, the involvement with God. And that requires to put the brain down, to put the tool of the mind down and engage with Hashem spiritually on an Amuna level. That's the meaning of the phrase, a leap of faith. Diluk, a leap of faith. It's very, very, very important. And uh, I'm going to share something a little bit controversial, but I'm going to say it nevertheless. I, I teach in Mechon Liados. I taught the Mechon Chana for many, many years. And one of my students said to me in a, in a moment of truth, he says, Rabbi, I uh, started to become religious and I lost my relationship with God. This is a quote. 
I started to become religious, or I became religious, and I lost my relationship with God. Um, and I understand the sentiments behind it. This was a girl who came from South America who had a simple relationship with Hashem. She just had a relationship with God. Whether she discovered it on her own, or she was raised this way, or she had some kind of an influence. And the relationship was meaningful and simple. You know, I'm sure she talked to God like I'm talking to you, and it was not a big deal. And then she got involved in Yiddishkeit, Yiddish had all these rules, you know, you have to do this, and you have to do that, and you can't do this, and you can't do that. And she got so preoccupied with what God wants, she says, I feel like my involvement with what God wants is making God himself being more distant from me. And that's a terrible mistake. So you could almost say that this notion of a leap of faith is not only relevant when we're talking about our intellectual knowledge of God in terms of our relationship with him, but it's even in terms of our intellectual knowledge of Torah. That we study Hilchus Shabbos and Hilchus Kashrus and Hilchus whatever else it may be that we're studying. And on that basis, we become very, very proficient into the nuance, the detail of halacha. And we learn it, and we live it, and we love it, and we do it. There needs to be the connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the relationship with the Eivishter, which is simple. It's not separate, but it's not automatically included in the, in the preciseness and the orthodoxy of us doing his mitzvahs. You have to have a relationship with the Eivishter. We're not allowed to be so from we forget about the Eibishter. Or like I tell people on, on other occasions, you know, you don't want to get, let the prayer book get between you and God. When you dive into the Eibishter, you're reading all these words. The words and the rules of when you have to sit and when you have to stand and when you're allowed to speak and when you're not allowed to speak and what you're allowed to skip and what you're not allowed to skip. What's better to skip? What's not so good to skip? All those rules can stand between us and the fact that when we're davening, we're connecting to HaKadosh Baruch and that's the idea of Amunah. And one last thing I'm going to say in Amunah that I'm going to move on to Betochen. My girls in Beisifke in seminary once brought to Sin Hanukkah time a couple of years ago. I got very, very excited by it. I made a whole shit out of it. Maybe even it's online. It could be it's online even. We're a Jew. It was Hanukkah. Hanukkah is a Yom Tov that Jews keep in very high numbers. And Bedera Chateva, Bedera Tachnes, because of the, because of the Goyi Shechaga at that time. And uh, Yid on the Facebook made a, a placard, made a page, uh, a desktop printed like sort of advertisement and he wrote, I love the Jewish religion. It's the only religion where you can be an atheist and you're still a Jew. He says, I'm an atheist and I'm still a Jew. And he found that delightful. I thought that was great. So I want you to consider what kind of atheist is so happy about the fact that they're an atheist and they still are a Jew. And of course, the answer to that question, an atheist who is by, who's no atheist at all. An atheist who has a very deep sense of his people a very strong connection and identity with them, which means whether he likes it or not, the relationship with God who created the Jewish nation and chose the Jewish nation and mandated the Jewish nation and commanded the Jewish nation. So when someone says, I'm so lucky, I'm an atheist, but I'm still a Jew, they're no atheist. And but then they, they have a conflict between their brain and their soul and they resolve it by calling themselves an atheist intellectually. But in reality, that's a very strong connection to HaKadosh Baruch. At Kanemuna, everything that I just discussed until now is faith. And faith doesn't have days and months or moments and seasons. It's constant. And Muna is like breathing air. Every minute, is my minute HaKadosh Baruch. And now we move on to Betachen. Betachen is in faith. Betachen is trust. It's one thing to say, I believe you, God. It's another thing to say, I trust you, God, right? Yeah, there are people who will say, believe me when I tell you that, and you will say, okay, I believe you. <laughs> when that same person, but trust me, and say, whoa, I believe you, but I don't trust you. <laughs> because belief means that you're not gonna lie to me, and trust means that you're not gonna hurt me. Those are two very different things. So emuna is elementary. Emuna is mamish alabes, excuse me. Emuna means I believe, and bezach means I trust. So I want to say this at the outset, trust is like eating food. You don't eat 24 hours a day. If you ate 24 hours a day, you'd be sick. You eat when you need to eat. Trust is an exercise that's a reaction to a situation. Something happens in my life and I need to draw koyach from my neshama to trust that Hashem is good and will be good to me. That's the concept of trust. Trust. And trust 
in addition to being something which is not constant, but something that we exercise, we use when we need it, is a choice. A person is going through a hardship, let's say. They have an option. They could pray, they can daven. They can give a lot of tzedakah, they could fast, they could cry. They can approach the challenge that the Abisha gave them in a variety of different ways. One of the ways is what the Rebbe calls trach gut vetzayin gut, think good and it will be good, which of course is trust, the highest level of trust. It's a choice. Something bad is going on in my life, I can daven and cry and beg Hashem to change it. I have other options as well. And have an option to trust that it's going to be good, trach gut vetzayin gut, and I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to say till him. I'm not going to give to Dhaka. I'm not going to fast. I'm not going to eat my heart. And I'm going to trust that it's going to be good. Trach, good, ved, sein, good. Like the classic story of the Tzemach Tzedek that we all know that it's, it's actually happened, right? There was a chassid by the name of Bishmuel. The uh, Mechol Bliner, who came from Nevelet, so they called the Mechol Nevelet. And when he was in Lubavitch as a mashpi, he was an old man, so they called him Mechol Der Alter. So we had three names, Mechol Bliner, Mechol Nevle, Mechol Der Alter. So when he was a young man, one of his children was literally dying. And he came to his Rebbe, the Rebbe the Tzemach Tzedek, and said, Rebbe, my son is ill. The doctors have written him off. And the Tzemach Tzedek told him, Tracht gut, ved sein gut, think good, then it'll be good. And of course, the story as it happened, as we know it, this yit had getracht gut, when it says given gut. He thought good, and it was good, in fact. In other words, his thinking positively, trusting that Hashem is going to give his child a refuah shleimah when the doctors had written him off, created the keli for the, for the refuah shleimah to happen. He was actually thinking positive. Trach gut, vet sein gut. He thought good, and it was, this is called trust. And this is not easy. It's not easy at all. When you're looking at a terrible situation, and you're literally making believe it's not terrible, you're looking at it and you're saying it's good. And you mean it. As they say in Yiddish, men halt by them. You actually trust that it's going to be good. You trust that it's going to be good. That's an extraordinarily difficult thing to do. And this alone is the keli. The Rebbe says in the Kutusich, as the and Chelek Lamed Vav, the famous Sicha, is the keli. This alone is the medium that affects the miracle should happen. Vet sein gut. Trach gut, vet sein gut. But there's one upside to trach or vet sein gut. In other words, I would argue that it's a very difficult avoider. Saying tilim and crying and putting money in the pushka and davening is easier, I would say, than trachut v'zayngut. But trachut v'zayngut has one huge advantage, which I believe is part of the reason why it was so important in the Rebbe's paradigm, is because it's positive. And the Rebbe believes everything in our life needs to be positive, nothing in life is allowed to be negative. Even the negativity of tshuva, the Rebbe sort of almost cancelled, or maybe more than almost. So trachut v'zayngut, to find yourself in a difficult situation and to trust that it's going to be good is extraordinary. It's an extraordinarily difficult thing to achieve. But it's, the Rebbe has made this into a Yesod Moise, the foundational idea in his teaching and his inspiration. And you know and I know, we all know, that the Rebbe inspired us in it in us because this is what he himself was holding. That the Rebbe himself was not just a Maimin, but a Beteach. That the Rebbe in his own life not only believed, but he trusted that it's going to be good for each one of us in a an open and overt and a revealed way. And the Rebbe was a man who sat in that little cubicle in 770 on the left side of the front door and received hundreds of letters a day. And I assure you that the majority of them, maybe the vast majority of them, did not have the Sudas Tevis. When people had good news, they forgot to report it. When people had Sudas, they didn't forget to mention it a hundred times. And the Rebbe's trust was unbreakable. It wasn't just faith. He believes in Hashem, but he trusts. Ved sein gut. And it's on that basis that he himself lived on that level that he allowed himself to make it so basic to the way we, we speak, and the way we think, based on the inspiration teaching of the Rebbe. Trach gut, ved sein gut. Think good and it'll be good. This is a mandate that the Rebbe gave us. Again, I'm... I'm stepping out on a limb when I say this, but it, I don't think there's such a radical thing to say. It's because the Rebbe himself lived a life full of betoch. And I want to start with this. Everybody knows there's a sefer called Shad HaBetoch. Shad HaBetoch in the section of Sefer Chavis HaLavavis and Rebbein HaBachir, Bechaya Ben Pekuda, Bechaya Ben Pekuda. It's a Musa Sefer which is quite old. It's from the four of the times of the Rambam. 
and of course it's quoted in Chassidus. There's some places in Chassidus where the Rebbe Bechai is the Chavis Alvavis is quoted verbatim, whole pieces of it. As far as I know, it is a translation from Arabic into Hebrew. It was written originally in Arabic. And in the Sefer Chavis Alvatochem, there's it's Chavis Alvavis, which means obligations of the heart, mandates of the heart. There is the section on trust. Shalbatochem. And of course, we all know that. I know a woman told me personally that the Rebbe told her several times after she went through emotionally difficult episodes that she should learn the Shara Talking from the Chivah Chivah Salavovis. She told me that uh, she came to my father's Zagazunzain with her husband that they should learn together the Sefer the Shara Talking from the Sefer Chivah Salavovis. And I know many people who were going through difficulties and the Rebbe would write to them that they should make a Kriyas to learn the Shara Talking. And of course, today we all are Talmidim of the biggest Beit Teach, right? Aluf Beis Gimel, Rabbi Shalom Merdcher, the Bashkan Zogazun Zayin, Emuna Betochen Geula, and he teaches it, and he has every right to teach it. He is an authority on the subject, not because he knows the material. He is an authority on the subject because he lived the material, and he lived the material for eight years. For eight years, he trusted. For, in other words, he trusted and didn't last. The trach gut was ein gut. Today I think good, and tomorrow it's going to be good. Eight years he didn't back away from his basic belief that a muna betochen gula trach gut ved zayin gut, and he was echet to gula shleim. His release is a big ness, and he is he is a ness. He is a sign. He's an indication. He's a reflection of. And it shows you, first of all, how difficult it is, and second of all, how real it is. So, I want to begin my betachen discussion in an interesting way. In this Sefer Chayv Salavavas, in the section of Shara Betachen, at the end of the section, the Rabbi Nebachia lists ten levels of trust. And I just want to go through the list. It's just interesting. I, I find it fascinating. The reason I find it interesting and fascinating is because it, by going through the list of all of these ten, you first begin to appreciate how real um, betachen is. Betachen means I trust you, right? I trust you. Who do you trust? Who do you trust? He says the first level of trust is an infant, a newborn, who trusts that his mother is going to provide him with milk. He nurses from his mother. And when he's between feedings, he knows, he trusts that the next time he's going to have to eat, there will be milk and he'll be able to nurse. It's so simple. His trust isn't even in a person at that time. It's chameid eivaz ba'olov. It's not yet yet the shayr keneu even. But he's, he's been familiarized. He has experience that the, his mother's uh, was given the gift of producing, of lactating, of producing milk. And when he needs to eat, he trusts that the milk will be there. That's the first level of trust. The second level of trust is after he hangs around with his mother enough time. And of course, he's not hanging out with his mother. He's stuck in a bassinet. His mother spends time with him, and she talks to him, and she sings to him, and she she idles with him, right? She spends time with an infant. The infant is never going to remember any of it. But she invests all of her love in this baby, and all of that love is what makes that child grow up to be a mensch. That she gets to trust the person, not just the milk and the source of the milk which is a higher madriga not chamer eivaz ba'olov but the other sheir keineu he recognizes his mother and he trusts that his mother's not going to hurt him he trusts that his mother's going to provide him he trusts that his mother will be there for him and then a little while later he develops to a third level of trust he trusts his father why did he trust his father? because he sees that his mother trusts his father not he trusts his father because of what his father does for him his father's a little bit more removed, but he sees that his mother relies on his father, and his mother trusts his father, and he trusts his mother, so by association he trusts his father as well. And then he gets older, and at some point he ascends to a fourth level of trust, which is to begin to trust himself, to believe in himself and to trust himself, that I can take care of me. Because he gets older, and he gets stronger, and he gets more self-sufficient, he's more independent, and he's also... Uh, self-reliant he can take care of himself he knows uh, he's a survivor he has skills and so on and so forth so he gains a trust for himself that's the fourth level of trust he doesn't only trust the source of the milk and his mother and his father but he trusts himself then when he gets even older he gets to a fifth level of trust where he begins to trust people who are not family members that even people outside of his family 
if they show themselves to be loyal and consistent and available and honest, he trusts them as well. They're further away from him. They're further away from him than his mother. They're further away from him than his father. They're certainly further away from him than he is from himself. And nevertheless, over time, you gain a trust for those people. I trust this person. He's not going to mislead me. He's not going to disappoint me and so on. Then you get to a sixth level of trust. And here you're already talking about the Rebbe You're not trusting a person, whether it's yourself or somebody else, you're trusting Hashem. When do you trust Hashem? When you can't take care of yourself. So long as you can provide for yourself and you can look out for yourself and look after yourself, you can trust you. But when you reach that precipice, when you reach those things, like most critically, for example, health, and in many cases also Panasa, when you're unable to look after yourself, you reach out to Hashem and you ask Him to help, which is Amunna, and recognizing your own vulnerability and need, and recognizing His infinity, you say, I trust you. But you're only using that trust in situations where you cannot trust yourself. So long as you can trust yourself, God is too far away, He's too ephemeral, He's too ruchni, He's too intangible. But when I get whoever, when you realize your own vulnerability, you're forced to turn to Him and you recognize that He's Almighty, you can do whatever He wishes, and you bring yourself to a place where you can't trust yourself, that you trust Him. That's the sixth level of Atahan. What's the seventh level of Atahan? That even in cases where I could take care of myself, but where taking care of myself is quite difficult or dangerous. So even though I could rely on myself and trust myself, because I'm able to ultimately look after myself, but I will say to myself, you know what, I'll leave it to God, I'll trust God. This is a higher level because you're not trusting Him only in desperate situations where you have no alternative, but you're trusting Him even in those instances where theoretically you could look after yourself. And you say, no, I'm going to trust Him anyway. Then there's an eighth level of trust. And the eighth level of trust is I trust God in everything. I trust God even in those things that, quote, I can take care of for myself or somebody else can help me with. I trust that Abish is going to provide. That's the eighth level. In other words, my trust is so deep that there's no desperation to it. I'm not only trusting because I have no choice. I'm not only trusting because it's very dangerous. I'm trusting because He's very real. So even though there are things in my life that I could provide for myself, I trust that He'll provide them for me. I'll trust that will help me acquire them. I trust that will help me get me from point A to point B. And that's the eighth level of trust. The ninth level of trust isn't about how much I trust him. It's regarding what? And the ninth level of trust is if Chas V'Shalom Hashem tests me and he gives me hardship and he gives me difficult, I trust that he knows what he's doing. I trust under the most difficult conditions. And I believe in Ashkach HaPratis, I believe in the hand of God, I believe in divine providence, I believe in divine intervention. So when I'm going through a difficulty, I can legitimately, correctly, quote unquote, blame him. But I trust I know what he's doing. I trust I know what he's doing, even in instances where he's making it very, very difficult for me. Like you have in the last Gil Chabina, right? al Rebbe wrote a letter called the last Gil Chabina, where he talks about Betachen, and he says that the Ein Ra Yer Mumayla, nothing comes from heaven is evil. Even though I'm experiencing it as a difficulty, but in truth I trust that the Abisha knows what he's doing. So it's not only I trust that in all things he's going to provide for me. I trust that even when he gives me a bad dish, he knows what he's doing because he's God. And everything that comes from him is good, even if I don't understand it. This is the ninth Madrega of trust. The tenth madrig of trust is that I'm not interested in all what God's doing for me. I'm interested in just my relationship. The tenth level of trust is that the only thing that matters to me is my connection to Him. And any other thing outside that relationship is simply unimportant. So it's not just I trust that when He gives me a hardship, He knows what He's doing. I'm above experiencing hardship because my entire self-definition is I trust that God is real and God is important and that's my involvement. That's the tenth level. So which one of these ten levels parallels Trach Gut Vet Zayn Gut? Which one of these levels parallels Trach Gut Vet Zayn Gut? 
it's not the ninth, because in the ninth you're accepting that Hashem gives me hardship and He knows what He's doing. Perhaps it's the eighth, that I trust Him in all things, even things that I'm able to look after for myself. But the, the correct answer to the question is that Trachet Vazangir is the tenth level. Because the tenth level is saying that my trust for God is very pure. My trust for God is based on my singular focus on having a relationship with Him. What I need is a connection to Hashem, period. And I trust that He's going to give me with that, that relationship. Which means my, the level of my involvement with Hashem is on a level which is above where tzadahs happen. In other words, it's a level where the only thing that's real is God and God is good. And although in the way it's written in the Shara B'Tochen, I trust Hashem in a level where I don't care about my tzadahs. But in truth, this tenth level is I trust Hashem in a level which, above where my tzadahs are. Because Hashem is good. And automatically, as a byproduct of that, if Hashem is good, it's going to be good for me. So I believe, I think this is correct, that trach gut vet sein gut, trusting Hashem, that no matter what is going on, it's going to be good in a revealed way, based on my definition of what good is, is a level of connection to Hashem where the only thing I care about is the relationship itself. And He is good, so it's going to be good for me. Trach gut. Recently I had a conversation with a person who wanted to find language for Trachut Vedzayingut. What does it mean, Trachut Vedzayingut? To think it's going to be good, it sounds like a, what do they call it? A positive thinking, which is a big idea in psychology nowadays, and so on and so forth. So I said to this person, Trachut Vedzayingut means believing that Hashem could do good. The beginning of Trachut Vedzayingut means believing God's in charge. He's not only the creator of the world, he's not only the former of the world, he is the world, he's one with the world, and he has enough power to do anything he wants. And he has enough power that even when a situation seems dire and impossibly bad, to do whatever he wishes, including to make it good. So the beginning of Trachot is believing in the divine power to make any situation positive. To truly believe that if God wanted right now, so and so would have an afu shleima, and so and so would find a job that's lucrative, and so and so would have peaceful shalom bites with his balabasta, and so and so would get along better with his children, and so on and so forth, and so and so will have nachas from his children. If God can do whatever He wants, He can do this also. So the beginning of it, the beginning of thinking good, trach good, vet sign good, think good. And it'll be good actually is believing that Hashem, because He is good, can do good, what the Rebbe calls always Teva Nidav Anigla, good which is good to me, that's evident and visible and revealed, good from my perspective, not from Him. And that's part of Trach. and good doesn't just mean Hashem is going to make it good for me. Hashem is all powerful and almighty and He can absolutely do it and He's going to do it for me. Why is He going to do it for me? Not because He likes me so much, but because He's good. He's good. And his goodness shows itself in his goodness to me as well. Tarakut vet zain gut. So as I said, the tenth level in the Shara Betochen, the Chavis Alavovis, that defines what Betochen means is that my only interest is God. And that level, my only interest is God, is consistent with think good and it'll be good. Because thinking good means that, that God is good. And God is almighty. And therefore, of course, he wants to do good for me. And if he wants to do good for me, he'll certainly do good for me. Trach gut vet sein gut. But like I mentioned earlier, it's not poshet. To think good is a mesiris nefesh. The upside of trach and gut is that it's a positive avoider. The downside of trach gut is a nishka gringe. It's not an easy avoider. It's not an avoider for the faint of heart. It's an incredibly intense and difficult and deep avoider. But Rabbi Isai, the Rebbe made it to a Nikkei. I spoke for, to Australia a couple of years ago. And one of the Shluchim, who's a relative of mine, who organized it, exchanged some messages with me afterwards. And he said to me, I think it's wrong to call the Rebbe Sar Ha'emuna. Because he's not Sar Ha'emuna, he's Sar Ha'betochen. I think it's wrong to call the Rebbe the Minister of Faith. Because he's not a Minister of Faith, he's a Minister of Trust. The more you learn the Rebbe Sichas, 
including the Lakuta Stechas, the Edited Stechas. And the more you study the way that Rebbe interacted with people, and the way that Rebbe taught people to deal with the realities of life and the challenges of life, the more you will discover that the Rebbe mandated Trach Gut Vetzain Gut, not just positive thinking, but the trust that since God can do whatever He wants, He's going to do good for me. I know a young man, he's unfortunately deceased, a very famous shliach, who told me that the Rebbe always used to write to him. He said, not every shliach used to get it, but the Rebbe always wrote to me, trach good vedzayin good. And the Rebbe writes, you've tried it a few times, you've seen the success of that technique, of that approach, so continue to trach good vedzayin good. So like I said, the beginning of it is to believe that Hashem could make it good, and therefore He will make it good. And when a person sets that course, as difficult a course as it is, out of Beis Gimel, like Shalom Archai says, Emuna, Betochen, Geula, the trust in HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the medium, it's the keli, it's the vehicle for Vedzayin Gud, for Teva Nida Benigah Gud, which is visible and revealed that we can all see. And let me tell you just how controversial this is, or maybe take the word just that, how controversial it is. First of all, you have in Lukut Tzichas, where the Rebbe discusses the difference between Rabbi Kiva and Nochem Mishgamzu. And Rabbi Kiva's expression was, "Kol Mada Over the Rachman Al Tav Over Everything Hashem Does Is Good." And Nochem Mishgamzu's expression was, "Gamzu Al This Also Is For Good." And the Rebbe explains in Lukut Tzichas. That the expression of Rabbi Kiva, everything Hashem does is for good, means right now it doesn't look that way. <coughs> I apologize. Right now it looks dire, right? Rabbi Kiva was sleeping in the field because they didn't give him a place to sleep. And the lion killed his donkey. And the cat ate his rooster. And the wind blew out his candle. And he didn't see anything favorable in it. And the next day he discovered that it saved his life. But when it was happening, he said, everything Hashem does is good, but he knows, I don't know. Nochem Mishgam is that Gam Zula Teva, this also is good, this Teva good for me. And the Rebbe explains that Nochem Mishgam Zul lived earlier than Rabbi Kiva. He lived in the times of the Beis HaMikdosh, as opposed to Rabbi Kiva, who lived after the destruction of the second Beis HaMikdosh. So because Nochem Mishgam was a couple of generations before, he had a higher level of betachin. So the Rebbe is saying to you and me, Trach gut vedzayin gut, not like Rabbi Kiva, like Nochem Mishgamzu. When you scratch it and say, wait a minute, Rabbi Kiva said, Kol mada over the Rachman l'tav over And the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rebbe said, Trach gut vedzayin gut, which is the Madrig of Gamzu l'tav. So what's the pshat? <laughs> Let me first compound my question by another idea, and then I'll touch on it. There is a mimer from the Rebbe Rashab, which the previous Rebbe repeats word for word. The Maimir is in Tafre Shai in Zion, 1917, which is probably 1917, and maybe 1916. Eleven years later, Tafre Pechas, the previous Rebbe repeated that Maimir word for word, and it's published in his Maimorim, verbatim, as his father's Maimir. In the Maimir, the Rebbe asks a question that Yosef Atzadik, asked the butler, right, the winemaker, to intercede on his behalf to the Pharaoh and to say, uh, and some way say, my boy, help me get out of the dungeon, out of the pit. And the Sadamashim forgot him and Yaisa spent two more years in prison. So Rashi says, in the it was a crime, it was a sin for Yesaf HaTzadik to ask the Sarah Mashkim to intercede, and that's why he spent two more years in prison. So the Maimon asked the simple kasha, aren't you supposed to make a keli a teva? A person sitting in jail he shouldn't go to a lawyer, he shouldn't try and help himself. And the Rebbe gives a crazy teretz. He says, there's different madregas of people. There's some of the madreg of Yesaf HaTzadik, which parallels the madreg of Nacham Gamzu. This doesn't say the Maimon, but that's the Chayr of Dibshad. And then there's a, a Yid in the Madreg of Yesav Atzadik's brothers, the rest of the Shvatim, that became shepherds because they wanted to be moved from the world. Which parallels the Madreg of Rabbi Kiva. Again, it doesn't say explicitly in the Maimah, but that's the Pshat. 
If you're on a level of Yesef HaTzadik, you're not allowed to make a keli in Teva. You're not allowed to make any medium in nature. Because you live in God's world. And attempting to help yourself navigate God's world is for you already an inyaf and heipachai amuna. Undesirable faith. Because when you live in God's world, God takes care and you do nothing. Nothing. If in the lower madrege, madrege de shvatim, so then you, because you're on a lower level, so you have to make a keli in Teva. So Yesav HaTzadik was punished because he was Yesav HaTzadik. So I pointed this out to many people. And this means this is a no-brainer. The Rebbe never said this Maimir. I would Rebbe. The Rebbe Zogazunza never said this Maimir. It's a Maimir that his father said, based on a Maimir that his father said, and I would imagine that the Rebbe Rashab took it from the Rebbe Marash, although I never looked up to say the Ishtashos. But my mother usually can be traced back all the way till the Alta Rebbe, or at least till the Tzermach Tzedek. This is an important moment, don't you think? It's a short little moment. It's an easy moment. It's a nice moment. But it's an important moment to talk about levels of Jews and how much faith they're supposed to have. The Rebbe Rashab said it. His son, the previous Rebbe, said it. And our Rebbe didn't say it. Now, of course, we're not entitled to understand why the Rebbeim do things. But I'm going to say a pshat anyway. The Rebbe didn't say it because he didn't want to say it because it's not for our generation. For our generation is the avoid of Yosef HaTzadik. Every Jew is the madreig of Yosef HaTzadik. That the Rebbe Rashab and the previous Rebbe said that the Shvatim, Yosef's own brothers, were not on that madreig. Yeah? And the Rebbe is proposing that in our generation we're all the madreig of Trach, Kut, Vezayin, Kut. And again, I, I am suggesting that the one of the ways the Rebbe presents that is by not having Chazad, this Yosef, this Dekamayim, the Rebbe, all the Mamorim of the Rebbeim that were important, that were repeated. This one he didn't repeat. And again, I can't tell you for sure that I'm correct, but I believe that the Rebbe didn't repeat it because the Rebbe held that in our generation, all the Madrega of Yesav HaTzadik. Like the Rebbe used to say, Anom is out of the Yesav. We come after the Friyadik Rebbe and we yarsh in the Friyadik Rebbe's avoidus and so on. Or to say it on a deeper level. The Rebbe himself lives on the highest Madrega Betoch. And the Rebbe feels that where the Rebbe is holding, each Chosset should hold. I, 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 <laughs> I, I believe that the Rebbe has p felt that whatever the Friedrich Rebbe was up to, he was up to. And the Rebbe feels that whatever he's up to, we should be up to. So the Rebbe took an Avoida that arguably is for a uh, Yechide Segula, Madreig of Yesef HaTzadik, Madreig of Nochemish Gamzu, not the Madreig of Rabbi Akiva, not the Madreig of Yesef HaTzadik's own brothers. And he made it household. He made it for all of us. The Rebbe empowers not just the Muni in Hashem. Every, that's what a tzaddik does. The Rebbe gives us God. You want to learn Yomari, you go to Rosh Hashiva. You want to learn Lochi, you go to Rav. You want to get God, you go to a Rebbe. A tzaddik. That's his job. He gives you the Ebishter. But he didn't just give us the Ebishter on the level of Amuna. That the Ebishter is real, the Ebishter is present. He gave us the, the Ebishter on a level of Toi Vanir Vanigla, revealed and manifest good. He's good to us. And when it doesn't seem that way, all you got to do is believe that it is that way. Trach Gut, Vetzain Gut. The Rebbe made this into an olive base. He made this into an olive base. And I, I, I think it's not so unreasonable to propose that this is a chiddush like Abedei the Shalafoneinu, generations before ours. And of course, the Rebbe would always use the expression, Aksha Dorabet Mia. Our generation is fit. If two generations ago they couldn't do it, the last generation they couldn't do it, we're going to do it. And the answer is, yeah. For various reasons, we're the midges on the shoulders of giants. We follow our Rebbe and our Rebbe himself lived by Betochen and he gives each one of us a Kayach that we should follow his lead and also be Baitchem Ba'avaye. We're also closer to Mashiach Tzadkenu and we're also more desperate. Our Golas is more dark and we have no Brede. Right? Like the Gemara says, in the end of the Ain Lon Amil Yishoin El Alavine Shabashamayim. We live in a time the only thing we can lean on is the Ebishter and not lean on the Ebishter with tears and with negativity but lean on the Ebish the Rebbe Betachin Gomer in Tevin Nirvan Nigla and the Rebbe I, I think it's correct to say the Rebbe made Betachin an expectation like I said to you before Betachin is not like breathing air it's like drinking water it's occasional when something requires it I also said before the Betachin is a choice it's an option you can pray you can put money in a pushke you can fast you can cry out you obviously could be mishtadl b'derech hateva, and you could trust. And the Rebbe has made this idea of trust a 
foundational idea in our own lives. And I want to finish just with a few little thoughts. The first is this. I want to point out, we are Shemi Tehra Mitzvah, right? We learn Tehra. We keep Shabbos, we keep kosher, Tehra Sabeshpacha. We give our children a chinuch, a Jewish chinuch, a chinuch al Tehra Sakodesh. I just want to point out that all of us, without even realizing it, are full of Betachan and Amunah. All the things that we do in our lives, all the decisions that we make, the way we raise our kids, the way we have Baruch Hashem large families, and the way we undertake to pay tuition, it's all based on believing that Hashem is going to provide, the Avish to provide, and it's not just Amuna, but it's Betach. And when we get into it, we don't know the full extent of the trust, but as we live our lives, we come to see A, the burden that we've undertaken, and B, how the Eibishta shoulders the burden. In other words, how the Eibishta helps us. Our tracht and gut translates into a vetz and gut. I understand it's not simple and it's not easy and it's not like a fairy tale, but it's real. It's real. We see the Yad Hashem, the Bechaz Hashem, and all the things in our lives. A Yid once went into the Rebbe. This is my final thought. I told you before the Betochen isn't easy. The one upside about Betochen is that it's very positive. And the one takeaway of Betochen, the lesson of Betochen is that we need to be positive Jews. I think one of the most critical areas where we feel the lack of the physical presence of the Rebbe since Gimel Tamas is that we have become pessimistic. We've become negative. We've lost our Hasidic touch. We, I mean Chabad, Lubavitch, Anash, Chassidus is God is good and my life is good. Now, in Chassidim aren't naive, they aren't fools, but they're stronger than the challenges of life and they live their life with the positivity. Over the years, says Gimel Thomas, I feel more and more we've become, instead of optimists, we become realists and it's tragic because the trademark of a Chassid is a positive person. The trademark of a Chassid is a person who looks at the world through good eyes. Because trach gut vet sein gut to lift Nebish this world, and of course the Rebbe was a, f- a firm practitioner of that. I once walked into the Rebbe and asked the Rebbe, "Was macht the Lubavitch Rebbe?" Which translates approximately, to, "How's the Lubavitch Rebbe doing?" Which is a bit of a chutzpah. And the Rebbe, without a hesitation, said, "Ich bin toll mit besimch." I'm always joyous. So let's give us our blessings that we should be positive and joyous, and that we should trust. And we should experience the vet sein gut, the revealed good, which is a response to the trach gut. And in conclusion, I just want to tell a story. Uh, what just happened? Did we disappear? Did I just disappear? Oh, I'm still on. Yeah, I'm still on. Yeah. Okay, I, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're, you're I'm sorry. My, my computer just made a funny face. Um, I want to finish with a story that there was a Yid who was a Ruzhan a Chassid a Chassid the Helech Rebbe Saul of Ruzhan and he was very poor and he had children to marry off and his wife was nagging him and no one wanted to make a Shidduch with him because he couldn't afford it and they had a very very rich relative an uncle who lived in Vienna who was obviously modern he wasn't a Chassid and he had a lot of money and he unfortunately had this big big house and he had no children and he had nobody to share it with but he had what they call in the Western world a good life. So his wife says, go to your uncle. He says, nah, my uncle makes fun of me. He says, I'm a loser. I'm a battle. So, but he has money and he has nobody to give it to. So this was an argument that went on. Periodically, his wife would start saying, what's going to be with our family? How are we going to marry off our children? How are we going to pay our debts? Go to your uncle. Eh. Anyway, finally, she convinced him to go visit the uncle. So the family got very excited. They bought him a new suitcase and a new coat and they got him some money they bought him a ticket and they put him on a train to go to Vienna from Eastern Europe and meet his uncle and ask him um, for, an, for some money to help him pay the bills that they had anyway he's about to leave the home he's all ready to travel he puts his hand on the mezuzah like uncle is again and he says I'm not going and he said what do you mean you're not going what do you mean you're not going He said, Verzak has a leapt. How do I know my uncle's alive? How do I know he's alive? 
Und als er lebt, weiß er, er hat noch Geld. Even if he's alive, how do you know he still has money? Maybe he lost his money in the market. And that hurt gold, where is that I feel given? Even if he has wealth, who does he want to give it to me? And he said very resolutely, Oh, but the Rebish that left, God is alive. When that hurt guilt, and he has plenty of money, when that will given, he wishes to give, and he puts the suitcase down. Show it. And the family was up in arms. They were so upset that there was a big screaming match, and it didn't help. A little while after that, a sergeant or a major from the army came through, and he knocked on the door, and he told this chassid, I know that you're an honorable man, so I'm leaving you all my wealth with a considerable amount of money. If I don't return in six weeks hence, or nine weeks hence, that means I was killed in battle, and it's yours. I have nobody else in the world to trust. You have to hold it for this amount of time. If I survive, I will come back and collect it. After that amount of time, it's yours. So uh, the time passes, the six weeks, the nine weeks, the 12 weeks, the 16 weeks, he's not coming home. And his wife says, okay, listen, now there's money in the house. And he said, you can take it after this many weeks. He says, no, it's not mine, I'm not touching it. And uh, they were arguing about this for months. He refuses to touch the money, it's not mine, I'm not gonna touch it. His wife says, the guy's dead. He left it to you because he trusts you that you would return it to him if he would survive and he hasn't survived, so it's yours. Anyway, after six months of this, he decides, ich zum Rebbe. And his question is, what should he do? He has a lot of money sitting in his own home, but it's not his. But the person who left it said, if I don't return by this and this date, it's automatically yours. May I use it? So he travels to Rishon for Shabbos, and he goes in to see his Rebbe, the Heli Kedush Rebbe, who was an incredible tzaddik and a great Baruch HaKadosh. He steps across the threshold of the Rishon's door before he can say a word. And the Rishon looks up at him with beaming eyes. And says to him in Yiddish, the Rebish that left, when that heart guilt, when that heart gave, God Almighty is alive and he has plenty of money and he gave you some. <laughs> so I say, the Rebish that left, when that heart guilt, when that heart gezunt, when that heart nachas, when that heart panosu, when that heart shalom bayis, when that heart mashiach, when that will gabin, he wishes to give zoler gab na alma be pale mamish. We should serve Hashem with a light heart, with simcha. I read the title of my talk is includes the words going through challenges in life we all everybody's life has challenges but the chassid does not define himself by the pain he defines himself by the fact that he lives in Hashem's world that give us all the bracha that we should be chassidim which means and Hashem should make it easy <laughs> I'm not in any way saying he should test us that we say life is good and that's more elementary than betochen it's just a Hasidic attitude it's a positive attitude in life and we should have the koyach for Amuna, and we should have the koyach for betochen and the Ebisha should fill our our wallets and our hearts and our minds and our souls with blessings of overflowing goodness and should be take a to the amitas and then will be the richtige ved sein gut a good night, all Yiddish kinder. Good night. Thank you all for listening and for joining. Amen. Thank you so thank so. You. Much. That was incredible. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Um, if you have any other ideas of people that you want to have speak, please reach out to me at my number nine two nine three two six one five two three. Have a great night. Okay. Do you have a question? Yeah, just because I heard him say that. Thinking positively is Mr. Snapfish. Is that true that I, I heard correctly? Uh, I think so. I, I think so. It's the same level. Mesira Snapfish means you put your soul what into it. Is it Mr. Snapfish? Mesira Snapfish doesn't mean you have to sacrifice. Mesira Snapfish means you have to connect. And that's the source of the sacrifice to trust that God is going to make my life good when it's not so good comes from the same place in the Nishama that Mesidus Nefesh comes from and it's the same avoid I have to dig deep you know I'm not serving Hashem with the soul which comes from my mind I'm serving Hashem from the soul which is higher than my mind and that's that's it's an idea of Mesidus Nefesh yeah yeah I said that and I meant it but you don't mean in the sense of sacrifice no, no, the sacrifice is only to sacrifice my life to Hashem, that my life is in Hashem's space. 
But it's a positive thing. It's not a painful thing and not a negative thing at all. Chas No, in no way. Thank you very God much. God bless you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Amen. Thank you. Yeah, chazak v'amatz. Cheski v'amtzi. Amen.